So, my name is Tom Phillips. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit based in Canton, Ohio called Start Fresh. I'm going to be doing the first part of the presentation. And then uh, Alexis Phillips, that would be my wife, she wasn't when I applied for this grant. Um, that doesn't always happen either. Uh, is the uh, owner of a microgreen farm called Wood Green Farm. So you'll hear from her in a second. And like we said, we'll, we'll leave uh, time at the end for questions. Uh, but before we get started, I want to try to find out who's in the room here. So you came to, you picked this class over the other ones, and I'm wondering why. So are people, raise your hand if you're here trying to, uh, you're mostly interested in trying to learn how to grow their microgreens. Okay, so a good percentage about mushrooms. Kind of the same thing. So the same people, mushrooms and microgreens. About here because you're interested in the component of um, dealing with poverty and how do we create jobs. So, okay, a pretty good mix. Good, we're going to touch on all of those things today. That's a lot to cover in an hour, you know, about 45 minutes when we uh, factor in questions. So we'll hang around for a little bit afterwards um, and, and try to answer some more. But first, I'm going to tell you uh, how this all started. So, the Sarah Grant is very much for farmers um, looking to uh, help and solve some sort of problem, right? So, like, hey, I've got this great idea. I need a little bit of funds to help me do that. Um, what Start Fresh does ties into that. Let's see if it works. So, Start Fresh, as I said before, the nonprofit has been around since 1983, but we started doing um, food access type of work uh, about 10 years ago. And so, our mission is tackling the causes of hunger. We do that by creating realistic pathways of poverty. What does that mean? It's a mouthful. Basically, all of our programming, programming is designed to reduce or remove the barrier for someone to take a step forward uh, or any step. It could be a sideways step leading forward. Um, and in that, uh, we have all of our programming follows these five tenets here. So, pathways out of poverty, uh, based on food, successful reentry, education, healthcare, and employment. We don't have time to really go through those today. There's a lot of information on our website if you're interested in finding out how we categorize and define those things. But, uh, all of our programming has components of these. We have two main focuses at Start Fresh. One of them is uh, food access, and the other one is how do we get more money in your pocket. So our target population are low-income individuals within Start County, Ohio. Um, so we mainly do that through two programs, uh, a grocery store program and uh, through our food justice campus. So I'll briefly talk about both of those, then we'll talk specifically about this project. So we're really good at coming up with a great idea and saying, hey, we'll just figure that out. So we look at empty gross places like this and said, hey, those are obviously perfect for grocery stores, um, whereas other people would not think that. And so we've done a good job of grocery stores. So 2017 is when we really started looking at um, what does a brick and mortar neighborhood style grocery store look like in our community? Uh, a lot of food insecurity. People have heard that term before. Have people not heard the term food insecurity before? Raise your hands if they haven't. Okay. Um, it just means that you're not quite sure where your next meal is going to come from. Um, so what we did is we, we, in 2013, we started uh, doing a mobile grocery market. So we would basically drive around the places where people were low income and had mobility issues and provide them with food and sell food out of uh, different vehicles, box trucks, buses, um, vans. Um, and the need just kept growing and growing. And people would say, hey, it's great that you come out here once a week and allow us to provide food. Uh, but what we really need is a spot we can go to every day or every couple days in our neighborhood. We said, wait, didn't we used to have something like that? 
like, you know, I'm 45, I remember back uh, hearing stories of my dad, you know, my mom talking about uh, where they used to go with their parents in little stores in their neighborhoods. So now we lost all that, right, in my lifetime. So he said, what if we just uh, look at the reasons behind that, and there's a lot, so we're on our, on our website, but how do we get these stores back in neighborhoods again? So 2017, we started looking at that, um, and we started, uh, in 2020, we opened our first one. We figured in the middle of the pandemic, it's the, first time, it's the best time to open a grocery store. <laughs> do anything, really. Um, so there's a bunch of stats and numbers up here, but really what it shows is that people are buying the food where they live. They're taking advantage of incentive programs. Um, and we're hiring people within the community, so we're creating jobs with these grocery stores. It's a small grocery store. The can one is, oh God, 700 square feet, 800 square feet, it's tiny. Um, so it's a little like bodega style store that you would see in any major city where you, you just walk to. The way I describe it is the uh, single most bought item in the store is a single potato, right? And this is some head shaking. Uh, I had someone push back on that thunder the other day, like, why don't you sell bags of potatoes? And he was in a meeting. I said, how many of you had a bag of potatoes go bad somewhere in your house at some point? I think everybody in here would raise their hand. Doesn't matter how diligent you are about making sure you use your potatoes, one's going to slip by it. Um, so people will just buy what they need. Come back a couple days later. It becomes a, an aspect of the community, which is a big part in you know, if you're, you know cultivating care, cultivating community. Uh, these become little spots where people who live in that neighborhood are not only getting food, but they're getting the additional benefits of interacting with someone in the property. Yeah. And then we open up in October our second location, almost three years to the date of our first one, um, and that's going along, well, that's about two and a half times the size. So again, the goal isn't necessarily to generate tons of income. If you look at these numbers, it looks like there's not enough money. <clears throat> hey, we're not profit, so part of our job is to convince people who are giving funds and money uh, for philanthropy to look at it a little bit differently. How do we help bolster our community assets and help people um, have access to things where they live. So, grocery store, that's a big part of what we do. The second part of what we do and where this grant comes in is our the work done on our food justice campus in Canton. Uh, so, it, it houses our first grocery store. We do a seed library out of it, uh, distribute about 100,000 seeds every year. Um, our food incubation center, uh, and then we've got two urban farms in the space. So, the first one I'll I'm not going to talk about it yet. Um, our food incubation center basically is uh, consists of the physical assets that we have in the food justice campus, and utilizing them along with training and other opportunities for people to be able to access those with a very small um, barrier. So that's food safety training. That's Business development classes. It's uh, we have the only shared use kitchen in Stark County, uh, which we don't know what shared use kitchens are. So um, office space is really cheap, so you come in, rent an office space with a cubicle and access to the conference room there today and Wi Fi, whatever, 24 7 access for $100 a month. Um, you know, things like that. Our kitchen is $16 an hour. So not real expensive to have a full functioning kitchen. So in that, and we're really good at taking spaces, right, and transforming them. So we uh, had this gross basement in the campus when we moved in in 2019 and said, weirdly enough, I looked at plans the other day. We always said, hey, why don't we throw mushrooms down here? That's like a great thing to do. Right under the grocery store with the mushrooms. So this is what we saw. Weirdly enough, we had a volunteer helping paint, I think, she was doing. Um, and we just get talking the way you do when you're volunteers. 
and it was right when the pandemic had started and she got laid off from her job. Um, and the job was eliminated, right, indefinitely. And she said, I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but all I've ever wanted to do is grow mushrooms. And I'm like, well, put it out in the paintbrush. <laughs> put it out in this creepy basement with no lights. And uh, let's show you something. And she, I think you have to be a little bit nuts to see nothing and see the finished product. But she's definitely a little nuts. And that's fine, as I am too. Uh, we took her down there and she said, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Now what? Um, and I've written a, a SAR grant, uh, SAR grant for this idea, exploring the concept of can we build out a space um, and then have someone who has not any background in mushroom growing be able to do a viable business out of it. Um, so that was the basis of that initial grant. Um, and so she started putting some stuff in, you know, and it's it's grown a little bit over the years. Changes. I, I don't take good pictures, so sorry about that. But what does, what does this mean? So she officially opened in 2020. I think about a month before we opened our grocery store. Uh, it was about fifteen thousand startup costs. She had like two thousand dollars that she put into it, but a lot of it came from the grants, and of course, there's all kinds of in-kind uh, components to this. Her business model is a mixture of wholesale and retail customers. She does farmers markets, but also sells to chefs um, and grocery stores. As of um, earlier, the middle of last year, her husband actually quit his job, which I thought was kind of a ball to do. So he had a very well paying job. Um, to come work full time for her marketing company, it's called Can Mushroom Works. And now the two of them do it full time. They're doing so well that they're actually have outgrown our space and they're moving into a building of their own that they're buying, um, which is great for them. Um, so, what do we do? We took that basement, we ended up having to put all the lights in. Um, ventilation is a big big thing when you know the mushrooms and making sure you have the right mixture of fresh air um don't have too much um it's being off gassed by the mushrooms themselves so getting that out um so we had to run i would say we do everything diy because we're a small nonprofit that is used to uh utilizing money best we can so it's a whole lot of like hey we've got some extra orange pvc pipe let's you know, run that and stick in some bands and, and do these things. Do plumbing, sinks, um, exhaust bands, basically from scratch, built out the space, trying to figure out the best way to make it work with our basement and the nuances of being in a basement um, and, and what that would look like. Um, you know, for us, for, for Start Fresh, uh, it became a thing for Kara, who owns this business, to uh, start a mushroom business without any having to put any real money into it. Um, that was a big thing. So for the first year, just about a year, year and a half, I said, okay, once I'm going to do this, um, I'm going to go hard into research and figuring out different things and talking to different mentors. We have a bunch of great mushroom growers in Ohio. She reached out to some of that in South Michigan and was able to learn enough to get started, enough to make it uh, so she could get something going. And then you, you end up learning from on the job, basically. Um, and so having a partner like us, having a site uh, where you can have access to training. Uh, for business development is a big part of it. I'm sure, Lex is going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but not being out on your own. So a lot of places have an empty space, right? If you think of churches, for example, churches tend to have utilize their space uh, a lot, one or two days a week, right? Um, you've got uh, private schools that might have extra space. You've got office buildings that have extra rooms. You've got lots of space that you can set up to do something like mushrooms very easily um, on a small scale. 
you might have a basement of your own that you might be able to utilize or a blue palace or something. So and I'll, I can talk about this a little bit more and answer some questions more, but I want to give less than time to chat. Thank you. So to get your testimony with our pass out. Um, I'm very nervous. Mm -hmm. Just getting that out there so I can look better. Um, but I'm Lex, I'm also a Tom's wife. And I also am an employee of Start Fresh. So I help run the Food Incubation Center, um, where the businesses that are just starting out, out or um, have been going for a little while use our kitchen at $16 an hour. So I love my job, love Start Fresh, and I also love my other job, um, Florida Mega Greens. So, to the beginning, um, research. I did a ton of research. You know, I read a couple of books. I read a lot of online articles, um, a lot of social media profiles. I reached out to some people that I follow on the social media for some advice. So I also traveled a lot around the area that I'm in um, to research other stores that sell microgreens to kind of you know, see what varieties are out there that people are selling. For how much are they selling them for? And the chef now the quality, all that good stuff. Um, Start Fresh Business Development Boot Camp. So I've taken a lot of classes for a lot of different things. Um, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a Start Fresh employee, but um, our business development boot camp, we teach it online and it's awesome. Um, I didn't realize how much I didn't know. It really breaks it down and it's easy to understand, like how Tom puts it, you know, if you didn't go to college for business and you want to learn you know, all of the little things that you need to do or just be aware of, it's a great class. Um, business plan. So my business plan took quite some time. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, thinking through things and breaking it down. It's the best thing you can do. So that should be quite a while, especially during you know life of work and two kids. Um, but it's worth it. So my name, uh, branding, online, print marketing. Um, I knew that I wanted to incorporate Mama into my name. <clears throat> um, that's something that's important to me. I mean, I'm a mom first. So yeah, little green Mama came to life. Uh, branding. So, like I said, I'm a mom first. Um, my kids help me. Well, our two year old likes to eat them. Um, and eat water. Uh, and then we have the eight year old. Um, you know, she likes to help me. Sometimes she's too cool for that, but, you know. And then uh, online. So, I've never built a website, didn't know anything about it, but who knows about Square? Square? Yeah, it's awesome. So that really like took me through each step of the building that website. Um, and it was surprisingly easy. Print marketing, um, who knows about Canva? Yeah, <laughs> Canva's awesome. Uh, I just learned too that you can actually create a website through Canva. I didn't know that part. But you know, flyers, yeah, social media posts, all kinds of stuff. So if you've never tried it out, please do. Um, pricing. So yeah, like I said, I traveled the area to figure out pricing, um, but I also, you know, taking that business class allowed me to learn how to break everything down and all my costs, you know, for my soil, for the containers I'm going to be using, for my time, all of that stuff. Um, so that helped me determine my prices of my materials. Also, try to keep them a little bit. On the lower side, uh, especially if I sell them in our grocery stores, because I want people to be able to have access to those healthy things. Um, test runs, tweaking, and workies. Yeah, that's never ending. Um, I grow 12 different varieties right now uh, to the family newer, and I enjoy it. Uh, it is all about testing. Sometimes it's frustrating, but you just, you know, you don't give up, you keep trying. The hustle. Yeah, so I go around to a lot of different, um, I sell in restaurants as well. So to a lot of restaurants in the area. 
Um, so part of that hustle is I see my kids. <laughs> That's fun uh, sometimes. Uh, but my daughter likes to, you know, she'll come with me and she'll she'll help with the money transaction. So she's like every part of the business with me. I think that's important that she learns with me. Um, yeah, we go around and pass out samples, um, capital to start, grow, and expand. Yeah, I mean, I love to say for this. <laughs> well, so when we work, when we, uh, we're successful with the Sarah Grant for the mushroom farm. Um, I think the next year or a year after, we said, uh, okay, when, when she showed an interest in doing microgreens, she said, okay, why don't we write another Sarah Grant uh, for microgreens? Um, obviously, it worked well uh, for the way we wrote it the first time. Let's, let's see about getting the, the build out costs um, and some of the training um, paid through this, this small Sarah Grant. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, so we're very much like Kara's mushroom farm. Uh, so we have a space. The basement's weird. It is still a creepy basement. But you walk down and there's this, you see this area kind of first. And then Kara has her farm and mushroom, of course, uh, through the door. But as you can see, it's very much the shell. The kids also help with this, you know. To get boxes and terrorize things. Um, but here's part of the other space. Now, then here's where we started to build out. So, you know, we marked out the area, the each of the floor, the walls, put a couple, you know, put some wood up there. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like now. So, you know, we added some cables. Um, I didn't install the sink, but I watched. I learned a little bit. Uh, Tom did that. And this is what it looks like now. So I have a little cooler. Um, this is my room where, uh, really, it's crazy. So I just used the shower curtain. Um, it sealed off. Obviously, it's temperature and humidity control in there. Um, and then I have magnets holding my door shut. So you don't need anything, babe, you know, to make it work. Um, because of, you know, the Sarah Grant, some of the things that I was able, you know, I bought some equipment with that, but, so, you know, we got, I, I bought food grade you know, racks, um, I was, I bought trays from Bootstrap Farmer, um, which you don't need all of those things to grow my food grades, you could just throw them in a container. Uh, to go container in the kitchen, you know. So I officially opened Will Green Mama in January of 23. It was uh, about a $15,000 startup cost. I choose to do wholesale focus. Um, so like I said, I sell and start fresh grocery stores um, to chefs, okay, chefs. I choose not to do farmers markets. There's Nothing wrong with them. It's they're great. They're, I love going to them. Uh, I just choose not to sell at them simply because I don't want to take that time. I don't want to, it would be, you know, she goes to farmers market with us, but doesn't have to do Let's get to Uh, oh yeah, so, you know, it was just a shell when we started. Um, so we had new lighting, electrical, fan. Racks, trays, soil, go till. They have a, a booth out there. Um, I very much love till soil because I mean, part of their mission is to food feed people, not landfills. If you don't know about them, you should check out their booth out there. Oh my gosh. I'm not nervous, I'm just like, um, but yeah, do plumbing, I uh, think, heater, humidifier, temperature controls. Um, yeah, I use Gobi, like for my humidifier, and then there's also three things that watch the, you know, keep an eye on the temperature for me in my room. It's really cool. It's a cool app. You know, I can always make sure it's right it needs to be with temperature and humidity. New wall built out. Yep, you saw the wall in my luxurious curtain. Um, and then here are our kids. 
So this is Amari, our daughter, she's eight. And then my our son, Rahman, he's two. Uh, that's different. So yeah, these are important pictures. Um, this, this is why, partially why I do what I do. Um, and also these weren't forced, just so you know. My daughter uh, planted her first strain of microgreens, stayed with it the whole process, harvested it, and then I read waters in the <laughs> um, So like I said, I don't do farmer's markets, but there's nothing wrong with them. I did reach out to a couple people that I have been here speak recently. Um, so Matt Herbrook and uh, Christy Welsh. So there's some information uh, about them on here. Um, they both have a lot of experience with farmers markets. Plus uh, Matt, which is really cool. I mean, he was super laid back and it was fun. And even though I don't do farmers markets, I learned a lot um, for partially for something I do with Star Cash too. So please take down their information if you have any questions about farmers markets. Yeah, so before I we take questions, um, yeah, the biggest thing, and uh, someone had said it, one of the people meeting had said, just do it. Um, yeah, just do it, right? That's that's what farming is all about. Is you get to try it. You can read all the books that you want in the world and speak to as many people as you want, but until you get in and start messing with it, you're not going to know what you're doing. Um, and the only way to do that is to, to try. So mushrooms, you know, Kara was interested in mushrooms before she came and volunteered with us to grow them in her uh, bathroom, right? Nice humid air uh, spot. A little gross to think about it. But that's where a lot of people start out when they're experimenting, right? Um, you don't need a whole lot. You can get a, a, a kit and do it or you can do it different ways. Uh, microgreens, I, I heard you talking before we started saying, hey, I think my wife ever seems so and do this for that. And you don't have to buy special things to get started, but if you're going to try to turn into a viable business, uh, it's helpful to have a bigger space in which to do that. Um, but just do it, right? Uh, if you have a great idea and start talking to other people about it, Chances are they may say, hey, I've got a space that you can use, or hey, we've got these extra things. Really enough, when we started building out the basement, we had people saying, hey, we've got these like seed heat mats that we don't use anymore. You want those? You want some fans? You want some lights? I'm like, okay, at this point, we have too much. We don't know what to do with them, and we don't necessarily need them. But getting the word out, um, you'd be surprised when people don't have way around they're not using that you might give you less. So, uh, yeah, we adapted very long presentation into a short one here to be able to answer some specific questions, thinking it might be easier to do it that way. So, people have questions. You want to answer either in the marketing or if you're thinking about this, so he asked about um, issues with some that I have with market uh, with. Um, Means and marketing. Uh, like I said, I did a lot of research, um, and while I'm growing, I'm making sure that you know my crates are clean. Um, I use a food grade three percent hydrogen peroxide to sanitize the trays too, um, specifically for that too. Um, and then I make sure that I'm growing my varieties to the length that they're supposed to grow. And I keep a pretty close eye on them. So I have a, a good procedure with each thing I can uh, supplement that. So I hope that answers your question. And I will say, uh, last year, I think, the years start around the other. They all have since COVID. Um, Carol was able to get um, GAP certified for her farm on the end. The, uh, either one city water, I'm sorry, we're in the middle of the city. Um, so there's no other parking or anything. We're on city water. Um, I know you were off gas and you know, before you need it, nothing she does. Um, so we're already dealing with a good water source um, and there's good practices to help make it safe. In the market, do you find any concern in the market? 
Uh, he asked if I find any concern um, with my bias with that. Um, I actually don't at all. Um, nobody even mentioned it. And all the chefs that I deal with, they know what my favorite things are. Not a lot of, you know, I'm sure everyone in here knows what they are, but if you know, on the street, if I were to walk by someone and say, hey, no, my favorite things are, they would know. But chefs know what they are and um, they don't express concerns. I know Kara does a bunch of tours of people before they end up buying. Um, on the other part, I don't know if you've done planning, but that's how we've got people. So you're doing that. Uh, so it doesn't look like you're working with too much space. How much space do you think it's like a necessary threshold in order to have, you know, buy a piece of space? Okay, so if you're asking about space, um, how much space do you really need? Um, like I said, if you wanted to, it depends on, you know, who you're wanting to sell to. How much you want to sell, what your goal is, um, yeah, your funding as well. But I mean, so you kind of saw my space, it is real small. I could probably fit three of me, you know, together standing and I'm all quiet it is, but you could use one rack and you'd be surprised at how many trays you can throw with one. You can stack on, you can, you can make the space bigger than it seems. I hope that answers. Yeah, great. Thank you. This gentleman right here. Going from the fact that these are the are the operations that are going to be very specific. So, the fact that you are dealing with waste. Okay, yeah. As far as dealing with waste, what did you finish? Um, so I take the after I harvest. The so microgreens, I take the trays and I take them to. So we have a farm, an urban grain farm. I take it there and then I just dump it right in there. You know, reusing it, so we have soil. So. Uh, did you share this in your research and really try out the particular farm and find so I've done a lot of research. Um, there's one person in particular that I follow that uses cooking for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just really want mostly first of all, I love laying there. But um <laughs> till soil uh, really kind of is what made me change my thoughts. I would like to support them. Well, yeah, and so they're based out of Cleveland. Um, so from where I am, it's you know it's a little over an hour to drive to get it, but it's worth it. Um, you know, there's also hydroponics, but I like the fact that I think I'm using a really healthy, high nutrient based soil um, to grow the microgreens. <laughs> Good question. So, the, Can you repeat it? yeah, the question was um, you like to utilize a vacant house. You have bad friends who make their ideas are implorable <laughs> and are trying to talk you out of it. And then you asked about uh, electricity. Um, is there any special electricity requirements? Um, I'm just joking about the breath. <laughs> 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 Yes, maybe that. Um, no, it's just regular um, outlets, um, regular stuff. Uh, so we, because we've got a bigger commercial building, um, we overdid it a little bit with making sure that the available power is there. But you know, for the the mushroom farm, really, it's just fans, fans, uh, plug in a heater, so that's a circuit, um, and some lighting that you're. It's like going on and off. Um, so easily retrofitable in any space. Um, same thing with the microgreens. Um, depending on how much you do, back to the volume question that you were asking, is if you do five or six times what's happening there, you might need more circuits, but you can run extension for it, you can do things. 
you probably have whatever you need and whatever room you're trying to make happen. Um, without anything extra. Being vacant, you might want to have it checked out first, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can find it. I mean, I saw a weird little uh, um, code in the conference hall. I was like, boy, this would be great. This thing's a nice end. I turned there what it was used for. Go ahead. Um, with respect to her question on retrofitting um, an old house, the only thing that comes to my mind initially was to be that I would try to hook up with a certified electrician and, and look at the wiring, and I probably want to make sure I had EFI plugs in anything that's got moisture in it, yeah. much like you do in your bathrooms. That's not my question. So you deal with Restaurant, you're dealing wholesale, and to the extent that restaurants are a significant part of the wholesale business, you deal on cash on delivery. I mean, restaurants are notorious for just like going out of business overnight. How do you protect yourself financially from dead deep clients? Okay, that's a great question. Did I go on your end? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, that's a long question. Um, so he asked how. I protect myself um, financially since restaurants are a big part of, of my business. And they're notorious for bad and, years. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, they're known to just shut down overnight. Um, that's a really good question. So, all of the restaurants that I sell to, they've been around quite some time. Yeah, I know. You're like, well, that doesn't matter. Yeah, so, with General Motors in 2012. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Big, big, big. But I mean, I do. All of them are, they have been around for a while. Um, and the chefs have been there for a while. I don't, not one that I deliver to actually has like, you know, a new chef every two months. So they've been there a while. Um, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. So they do pay uh, on delivery. Some pay in cash, and I look for that, you know, using my square. Um, so, and then sometimes they pay in in a check, and I also keep track of that. Um, but it's COD. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's COD. Yeah. That's a really good question. She asked if I made my startup money back, and when do I expect to? So I make about three fifty to four hundred a month on my just just on restaurant sales. Um, so you know I haven't made it back yet, but you know it started out real slow. But I made yeah, I made I did make my investment. So yeah, the beauty of having the, the initial build out cost paid for by a grant means it's better than to pay back. So it's not a loan. That's been paid back. The, the things that you bought beyond that, the grant didn't cover, I would say you definitely paid back. Yeah, definitely. Because I didn't think about it like that. But. Sorry? Start from How did you decide what to do with the theory of the clothing and other things to use for them? One. And two, we you use the clothing place before any other aspects of the overall business? So it was a two-part question. The first one was, how do we decide what what did we use to decide what's initially carry in the store, specifically produce? And the second one was, uh, how else do we use the grocery to support our mission? Is that correct? Um, yeah, so like I said, uh, 2013, we started a global market. We didn't open a brick and mortar until 2020. So we had seven years of historical data of just interacting with people and, and purchasing with our within our community. Um, and so a lot of it, the initial stock for the store was based on that. Since then, and we've got two different locations 20 miles apart from each other, so it's slightly different um, clientele. Um, you know, for example, I can't keep um, I can't keep pineapple in stock in one spot, but in the other location nobody cares. <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, but we have a very scientific method of figuring it out. We have a pad next to the register, and we have people write it down what they want. 
and then we, we get those things. And then because it's a neighborhood store and you're interacting with people and the people who shop there are regulars, you get to know what people like and what they're looking for. So you can also make suggestions on other things. It's funny that they, they joke around with me because when I'm up in a store, which isn't very often, I somehow always get into a conversation that ends up like this, like, oh, have you seen that we have zucchini in? And they go, oh, I don't eat that. They go, well, why not? Like, I don't like those yellow squashes. And I go, okay, well, how do you cook your yellow as well? You know, they tell me, and I say, well, you can do the same thing with the zucchini, uh, and it's pretty good. And they, uh, it becomes an avenue to also sell them on other things that maybe culturally they haven't been exposed to, or uh, they just didn't ever feel like trying. Um, so that's like, I think that answered your first part. Uh, the second part is, or was, um, how does the grocery store interact with the rest of our mission? So, uh, if people are worrying about food all the time, if someone is living in a poverty situation, you're always worried about a million different things. They are so good at that juggling life because it's the reality, right? You don't have time to breathe. Um, we can talk about this for two hours. But basically, uh, if we can take the food aspect or alleviate the food aspect a little bit, it allows a little bit less stress so they can start dealing with some of the other things. And so that, that's like the part of it. Uh, a lot of what we do with the grocery store, it's not just a regular grocery store. I say it's a regular grocery store, but it's also not. Because if you come in and you're using um, your EBT snap card, food stamps, um, if you're not familiar with them, uh, they uh, can get fruits and vegetables tap off. Right, so we've got funding to help pay for that. We also have um, an EBT match program depending on um, which brand that we have going on. So we've gone out as a nonprofit, sought funding to say, okay, we've got fifty thousand dollars that we're going to apply towards this match program. Someone comes in, uses their car, they can get fifty percent of the ten dollars, so basically five dollars worth of free food on every visit. That, that took me like 10 years to get that in place because funders like, oh, they're going to go and people are going to go out and buy um, lobster and chips. And you right, you hear these arguments all the time. Like the people are coming in to use that match to get meat or the dairy that they couldn't get at the food bank or you know, food, you know, food, produce, things like that. Um, we also work with, again, this rethinking philosophy or philanthropy. Uh, we work with lots of people who have funds that have traditionally given to a food bank or you know, some other program and say, look, people are shopping, whether they um, are shopping at Walmart, um, it's not a lot of neighborhood stores around anymore, but all of these spots where people are shopping take money out of neighborhoods. Right? We're putting these stores right in the neighborhood so people can walk to the store that's in their neighborhood. Spend the money there, with, you know, and paying the salaries of the people who work there that are also from that neighborhood. Um, it's a better model. So if you can buy a voucher system, vouchers that you're then distributing to the people that you're interacting with, you're also helping them get some money. So um, it, it ends up reducing the bill. It's good to get it. We also do things like source from non-traditional channels. We have, you know, we have relationships with farmers. We've got regular grocery wholesale channels. They can't get Doritos from farm. But they want Doritos. Um, different vendors, but uh, local vendors who are starting businesses. Um, but we also uh, take advantage of secondary wholesale channels that some people don't think about. There's a lot of blood in the food system. You know, I, I got... Uh, contact the other day, it's a little bizarre, but someone had a pallet of beef tips because the uh, nothing wrong with it. It's on a refrigerated truck. The plastic that they wrapped it in had a, a cut in it, and I, I think it was from just bumping against another pallet, maybe then moving around. The receiver refused the delivery. They have to get rid of that before it goes out of town. So we're right around the corner from a bunch of big shipping companies and said, can you take this? Absolutely. We can get with that. So like taking advantage of 
and waste in the system is a big part of it too. Does that answer your question? Okay. Where do you get your key? I actually have a two part question. She said, where do I get my seeds? Um, I buy the seeds from Tree Leaf Market, uh, which is a pretty big one, I guess, and then Green Harvest. Second, third. Okay. 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 Um, why would salmonella be an issue? Um, yeah, so it, it's the water. It's, um, yeah, and listeria. So it, you know, well, what water you're using doesn't make a big difference, which you know, Tom said it well, the, the local water. This theory is the water, some water, it's, it's, there is a lot water too, but um, it's how clean um, the pellets are that you're using for your drug. Basically. In, in, in these two, it's a little less than when you're doing something large scale um, farm where you've got runoff, which is a lot of times just not one full time. Because you're dealing with soil that is basically compost, right? Um, and then you are dealing with so it's going to be different to be into. Um, and then you have the water, you're taking a lot of that risk out. Hi, can you speak into the re entry portion of um, your work with the grocery store? Yeah, so we have a thing on our application that I didn't. Oh, the question was um, talk about re entry um, specifically in the grocery store. When uh, we have a thing on our application that I didn't think was too novel, uh, but it simply says, hey, do you have any criminal background? Uh, and people don't like answering that question. So the, the in the same sentence it says we don't really care if you do we just need to know um, we realize that people who, who someone is now is not necessarily who you were right and so that is a big thing um, so reentry isn't just people coming out of prison it could be someone who has been a stable mom for a period of time it could be someone who was in the military it could have been you know, uh, a lot of different things with re-entry, um, but we're we're just big on who are you now? Who are you care what you did before? We hired people that we hired an individual who spent ten years for manslaughter, right? As a well, he got uh, he was seventeen when it happened, but he was twenty by the time he got actually sentenced. Uh, probably a lot different as a thirty year old, twenty year old. So we can do that stuff a lot. So, so we're so I just wanted to say too, like uh so I'm like I'm also you know I'm an employee, but I'm also recovering addicts for years. <laughs> so lots of different ways, but you know, who is the person who is a human? Don't really give a shit about that. Did I answer so so many somewhere. How do you go about building connections with restaurant chefs or so forth in where you start? He said, how do you go about building relationships with chefs and clients? Um, so I have to do that design, but you just have to do it. You just, you know, you take your, get your samples ready. Um, yeah, that's part of the hustle. Samples, I'm sure you want some sort of wire. Um, you know, yeah, bring your students. Talk the entire time. Uh, business cards. You know, have all your stuff ready together. Um, also, yeah, I do have some flyers as like an example. And if you're interested, um, go on the table and your this first. Um, but yeah, you just gotta go in there and like, hey, can I speak to the chef? Also, do your research about the restaurant that you're going to. Learn a little bit about them, what they do. Yeah, stalk them on social media, look at online articles, um, and then just go in there and just kind of have a conversation. And it's easier than you think. You know, you'll get turned down, you'll get, well, maybe, and then you get, yes. So just, just do it. Thank you. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about the um, process of getting the system, the lesson process of getting the system? 
your bank name or the bank name to their own facility and how that works. I'm interested in learning um, about finding spaces, formal agreements, informal agreements, and what that is. Yeah, so the question was basically to grow from operating out of the basement, smaller space, into um, their own space as a weapon farm, kind of that process. Now, probably about six months ago, Kara had come to me and said, Hey, we, we're like, we're not quite at capacity, but in order for us to take our next step and start doing some things here, we are going to be at capacity, and that's going to be an issue for us. Um, we said, Okay, so like, we can't make the basement the bigger. So, like, it's a limitation, right? Um, so, what do you want to do? You want to set up something in our courtyard? What's your thought? She goes, Well, you know, I, I think maybe it's time for us to look for a building. Um, and being in a being in Ohio, <laughs> in a city, there's lots of buildings uh, that aren't being used. Uh, so she started looking, and yeah, it took her about six months to find an empty building um, that has been empty for about ten years. Um, so the buyers are motivated to have it go. Um, the city is very excited about. Um, any sort of development whatsoever, especially in the area that this was, they're actually rezoning it because it's it, it's in a residential neighborhood. So when things got rezoned, you know, at one time there were businesses and houses all in the same area and it rezoned and done all sorts of crazy things. So it was no longer zoned for what she needed to do. But part of the stipulation of her sale was I need to have this rezoned. And there are some things that had to happen. Um, so it's just knowing what you want, not being afraid to say, hey, I am an asset too. I mean, this tiny little mushroom farm, she's tiny. Uh, uh, she's, she's like, I'm this tiny little mushroom farmer, um, but I have value. My business has value. Um, this part of this neighborhood uh, isn't the greatest neighborhood. And with some crime issues, so having more foot traffic there and you know, people coming in and going to their space, picking up things also helped that deal with She was able to sell that to the officials to get some concessions on things. I think like the main water line is messed up going into the building, um, and so that's been taken care of before the sale goes through and things like that. I hope I answered your question. Um, but you did. Yeah, I can only really speak to what um, I can speak to the start fresh side, um, maybe even speak about what you do stuff and stuff, but. Um, we just do MOUs. Look, if someone's going to be dishonest, they're going to break a contract, an MOU, or whatever. So, uh, also don't have it as a fast process. I think probably many years ago, we were quick to get anybody working with us and didn't have the drawn up process we have now for getting those partnership interactions. Now it's, no, we need these set of things. These are checklists. Here's what we require. Um, here's what we require of you. Um, here's what you can expect of us. Lay that all out. And then put it in an MOU and then kind of have a little MOU orientation on it. MOU stands for Memorandum of Understanding. Um, it's like an informal contract. Is it binding? No. Our contracts binding, and I think the lawyer. Like so, like, that's how we looked at it, uh, and our board is comfortable with doing that. Oh, use that when we work with it uh, because it's not necessarily binding, but it keeps everyone honest. Uh, we found that those work best for us. So, I have my question about the grocery. Um, uh, I know it's a nonprofit. Do you feel like you have competition uh, for getting the community to engage in the store? I'm just thinking about uh, what's happening in Dayton 
there's a cooperative market that's across the street from the dollar store. And we've known a lot of uh, people that have like, a lot of money uh, are now getting their grocery in the dollar store now. No, you know, we can, you know. So I'm wondering how do we deal with that, or is that an issue as a nonprofit? Yeah, so the question was, that's about the most. Uh, it was regarding grocery, we affiliated, you know, regular competition, even though we're not profit, I guess. Um, yeah, so I explained this to someone the other day. Um, I'm going to go a weird way to explain it. We also work with people with produce prescription programs. Has anyone heard that term before? It's it's like it's it's her. Yeah, well, no, first, yeah. Uh, First, we're going to do a but basically, doctors will say, Hey, yeah, you need to take some medicine, you need to exercise, but also, here are some vouchers that you can use to buy some food because we all know that if you eat better food, that for the right, not to go into that. I was at a meeting with people who clearly don't interact with the, the people that. They're serving very often. I'm trying to be nice. Um, <laughs> and they said, yeah, we've got it figured out. You know, it was like a planning meeting. I said, all I want to do is redeem the vouchers to make sure that it's fair and equitable and we don't have expiration dates and stuff like that. Um, and they said, well, we've got it all figured out. Um, we're going to give it to these families and they're going to make 10 meals a week. And I said, oh, okay. Like at home from scratch? They said, yeah. I said, okay, on this call, it's about eight people. I said, how many people made 10 meals this week? <laughs> How many do you think raised their hand? Zero. I said, so realistically, what do you think? Four? You want to start with four? Three? And they agreed on three based on like the quick consensus of how many meal people made in that room. And I said, hey, you need to think about what you're doing. Right? So me saying that is it, it led into a discussion. I said, is what you're I said, what are you trying to accomplish here? I said, what and they sent their piece, and I said, okay, I'm going to put these in my words. We're a little bit harder edge on things. I said, all you're trying to do is get someone to change a pattern, right? And so if you could do that three days a week, for three meals a week, so that's a huge change. If it was one, it's a big change, but of course, what the week. Um, I said, you've got to look at it differently. So what we're doing with the grocery stores, we, we know that in order for people to shop there, they're changing their shopping habits, right? That's a win for us. Because once you change that pattern, um, it allows other things to change as well. Yeah. Um, so do we feel this competition? Sure. We're also not placing these right next to dollar stores. Uh, we're placing them in neighborhoods that no one wants to invest in, for whatever reason. Now, so at some point down the road, we'll see, oh, okay, like I showed stats in there before, maybe that looks attractive to someone, say, I want to extract that money out of the neighborhood, then we won't have that issue. But right now, no. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. So in the grocery store, too, uh, something that's different about Square Fresh is we make sure that we have foods that cater to everybody, People are amazed when they walk in. So we have a lot of, you know, vegan food. We have a lot of, you know, fresh meals uh, along with frozen meals, and it's a lot packed in this kind of over. So we really do the unique items. Yeah, I, I get. So if anybody's all able to shop there, it's going to be an asked a lot. It's probably our biggest hurdle because everything's oh, so for poor people. I'm like no, it's anybody. Um, so we carry this uh, gourmet pasta sauce. Someone actually asked about this yesterday. So why do we carry so many of the pasta sauces? Because it's all over in pricing. Okay, so we've got pasta sauce that's 90 cents, and then we've got pasta sauce that's $8, right? And someone looking at that says, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, that pasta sauce that's $8 only cost us 7 the retail of Markham on it everywhere else is 12. Right? We're making a dollar. Yeah. We're making enough. Yeah. Right? But it becomes successful. Now, if you attach the EBT match to that, now that's a $4 pasta sauce that is a premium pasta sauce. Good. So, 
don't know if I answered your question. No, yeah, yeah. 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 Security. If you have a security issue and not be a security or is it a problem? So he has to be a security issue. He's our biggest employee. No. Um, no. So when we, so our store is unique. So I said we started in 2017 looking at what does it look like at brick and mortar location. So we did a, a lot of surveying, about 2,000 surveys from people. Literally knocking on doors in the neighborhood saying, What do you want? Saying, like, What's concessions? You know, all sorts of things. And uh, there's really only a few things we want. They said, We want uh, well lit, we don't like dingy stores, we want to be able to see dirt if you have it, right? Which if you ever go into a, kind of a shitty store, it's not lit well. There's a reason. My previous life, I was a lighting guy, so I'm <laughs> um, so lighting was a big one, which is kind of a weird thought. Um, safety, uh, people had said, and I touch on that in a second since that was your question. They said, they, we don't want any, uh, we don't want you to sell alcohol or cigarettes or any of the devices because that attracts people that we don't want. Um, and um, the, there's something else, I don't know, security. Parking? No, we're in the city. We're in the park. Park where you can. There's a spot. Go for it. Um, but we did much of surveying. So safety was a big thing. We want to feel safe in that store. Uh, what we found, you know, we're in a city. There's realistic. We've got a, the retail spots. And people are going to try to push every button they possibly can and find out where that edge is. And so we just have to stay diligent. Um, but usually, you know, bags get left in the door. Um, we, uh, if you see someone stealing something, you know, our policy is not like targets. It's very much like, hey, you want me to bring you up for that an hour? Or, you know, like, oh, 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 yeah, I'm so sorry. You know, it's, you have to be diligent. You have to have an interaction with someone instead of just being a person behind the register. It's a, a community neighborhood store and we are interacting. So I'm talking to you this whole time. I'm looking you in the eye. And if you are stealing, and you're too dumb to like put it back at the counter and pay for it, then you just get banned. So it's simple. We have had um, times where people feel unsafe. We've got codes and stuff for that. We have lock keys. Um, but usually it comes down to people not on their meds. Um, and usually when you have four or five of us come up, we can just get them out of school. So I think we have not really had much of it. You know, the, a big part of your Security is the fact that you are here to the market. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it for that. I mean, is that the whole thing? If you see someone walk down the street that looks suspicious, you say hi to them. <laughs> and you interact with them. Yeah, just, just interact with people. It's not a big problem. It is not. Any other questions? Eric? So, uh, As long as it's not too keen, you can use it. for a university farm, and I'm guessing you have issues trying to deal with the surplus at times. Yeah, where, where are you located? Where are you going? Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. food bank. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's an issue. Food banks don't know how to do fresh food. They get one. No matter what they say on their uh, end of the report. Um, yeah, that's tough. Uh, what I have found, like for us, we accept stuff in and we sell things, but we also have some things available for free. So, like an example of food of bread. But when someone comes, like, hey, I want to get this food in the community. And if we've got a game or a full of zucchinis, I'm not selling, I can't even sell those. So it's, you know, how do we <laughs> let everybody know every recipe known to man with zucchini? Um, and everyone gets zucchinis whether they're white or not out the door. <laughs> and, um, it's hard. Uh, probably the, the best 
solution and not food banks. Um, there's not a lot of stores like us are people that are actually cooking food for hot meal programs <laughs> because they know how to, they're wizards with whatever they're given, right? Somehow every week, several, several times a week, they're making an abundance of food and it's all delicious and they're using things to, you know, whatever they're given. Those are the people, they're usually nonprofits or churches or both. The food bank should be able to let you know the list of those people. Yeah, the Cleveland Food Bank, they're all awesome. But you might be able to, so uh, United Way should have that list as well. So they actually uh, curate the list. So reach out to United Way in Cleveland. Yeah. Right here. I'm going to ask Everybody. She asked who uses the shared use uh, commercial kitchen, who uses the space. So we have people that have food trucks, and then that have had food trucks or want to have a food truck. They use our space for packaging and then you know, take it on. And they take our business class because of that goal, and then they use our kitchen. Um, we have people that use our kitchen as like a ghost kitchen. So what that means is they cook food, you know, they're there like nine hours on a couple days a week. People come and pick up the food from them. So it's you know like they're using that space at their restaurant, essentially. Yeah, when they use DoorDash, there's all kinds of things. Um, we have a yeah, caterers, we have someone who like comes in and just makes spices and you know, sells that. So many things. Okay. With your like microgreen and mushroom production, do you ever have to keep with mold, like keeping the humidity up? So she asked if we have any issues with mold on um, the humidity of like, mushrooms and microgreens. Um, I've come across it a couple times and you know, you just dispose of it. I haven't had anything crazy where like all of it is going in. I keep, keep a pretty good close eye on this is why I use the, the smart you know, temperature control things and like heater, the humidifier, it's all in one. Um and here does a pretty good job too. I haven't seen that have regular issues with it. The same thing as you know. Maybe you've got uh, a bag that's inoculated that started to go moldy or something, and you just have to get rid of that so it doesn't right. take over the rest. Uh, we've done a good job of that. You know, there's a lot of cohabitation. It's the basement under the grocery store. So, like, there's a lot going on. It's also like our main pipes for the building, and there's a sump pump. It's, it's a, a busy space in that basement, and uh, everyone has to kind of do their part. To that, that sign of anything to be carried the right way. So having those rules in place to know what to do when we encounter it has been the, the biggest saving grace. Uh, she asked what we do with the spent mushroom box. Kara uh, gives it to two different individuals, but we maybe three. Um, Lord knows we we on our their actual part. Oh, is that your answer? Is that it? No more questions? I, I applaud you for what you're doing and start front. Maybe. Okay. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you guys. Very right. nice.